So this is where we see that Judas Iscariot was already disgusted with himself. He was already disgusted with the 30 pieces of silver. And he went back to the temple treasury. As a matter of fact, if you go to Jerusalem, you can see the impression on the side of the eastern wall of the Temple Mount, of where the stairway up to the treasury used to be. You still see, and where the door was, but it's all blocked in now with stone, but uh, smoothed out stone, but you can see exactly where it was over on the uh, eastern corner. And he took that over to the temple and throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. It's in Matthew 27, verse 5. Now, only the Gospel of Matthew mentions Judas' suicide. Um, St. Luke reports of Judas' death in Acts 1 with a few different details. I uh, see that in Acts 1, verses 18 to 20, also a very short report. It says, Now this man bought a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation become desolate, and let there be no one to live in it. And, and it also says, his office let another take. So that then he goes on to explain that one of the other apostles, or a disciple, had to take Judas's place. There needed to be 12 apostles because Christ is founding a new Israel. And just as the old Israel had the 12 founders of the 12 tribes, here we see the 12 apostles founding the church. So that's the, the, the details there. And, you know, with the, the, the difference of details, I'm, remember St. Luke had spent some time in Jerusalem. He knew people who were there. And while St. Matthew gives a very summary statement, the, um, you know, this is something that, sometimes happens when a person, as a matter of fact, that typically happens, uh, when a person is hung, that they often lose control of their, uh, their, their insides and they, they you, know, you know, release the inner fluids and defecate on themselves. I think something like that is what he's talking about. Um, but that's not an unusual with people who hang. But this is something that is very important to reflect on. First, um, Judas had regret for having betrayed Jesus, but he didn't have true repentance. Big difference. A lot of people regret what they've done wrong, especially if they get caught. They're not sorry they did it. They just are sorry they got caught. And this is something that by committing suicide, you see that Judas is indicating regret over what he did. It was a mistake but not repentance. We presume that he did not believe he could be healed and forgiven by Christ. This is where despair gives in. You give up hope that you can be forgiven. And he turned that thought that he couldn't be forgiven into a self-fulfilling prophecy by killing himself. He then 
makes it impossible to uh, you know, tell God he's sorry. Now, we can only assume that he also had a problem with faith, that he didn't, just like the others did, that the other apostles also had a problem of faith in the resurrection. They didn't think that Jesus really would be raised from the dead. And when, when we get to the chapter on Christ's resurrection, we'll discuss that more in detail. But he had so little faith in Christ's words that Christ had prophesied he would die and rise again on the third day. He prophesied that. And Judas didn't have faith in Jesus' words. Judas had seen a lot of miracles. He had eaten the bread and the fish that Jesus had multiplied on two different occasions. He had seen you know, uh, Lazarus raised from the dead. He had seen the widow of uh, Naim have her son raised from the dead. And many other healings and exorcisms. He, it did not bring him to faith in Jesus. And furthermore, he lost hope. This is a very important thing when we take a look at the letter to the Romans, we, we see that faith is how we're justified. But it also says in chapter 8 of Romans that, you know, we are saved by hope. And Judas had neither faith nor hope. And he then didn't move towards love, which is what St. Paul goes on to describe in chapters 12 and following as also necessary. St. Paul always taught that faith, hope, and love are necessary. And he gave up hope that he could be forgiven and loved. So he, in a self-fulfilling prophecy, made self-annihilation his future. And this is something that is very strongly in contrast with St. Peter. Now, St. Peter denied Jesus three times. He said that he would never deny Jesus. He would die with him, and he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. And after the third denial, St. Luke also brings out how Jesus looked intently at him. It's a specific word in Greek to look intently at somebody. And Jesus looked right at him. And Peter had not mere regret. Oh, man, I messed up. No, he repented. He went out and wept bitterly. There's a tradition that he wept so bitterly that there were furrows in his cheeks. But that's a way to express, we don't know that from Scripture. We just know that he wept bitterly and tried to give us a picture of how deeply this was felt by him. And this is something that Jude, Peter did also leave the scene of the denial. But he went apart in order to weep and, and express sorrow. And it was tears of repentance. This is a key element for us. Judas went away and hung himself. And that is the major contrast. Now, horribly, horribly, this relates to the experience of a number of people who were involved in the sexual scandal the, the, inside the Catholic Church with the clergy. Some of the victims have, you know, experienced despair and, and committed suicide. You know, they, they, the betrayal that they had was so profound that they, some of them have committed suicide. They just couldn't cope with that. And there have been also some of the perpetrators of those crimes who also committed suicide. A few of the priests have done that as well. You know, for a variety of reasons. Um, 
a lot of times the victims blame themselves. You know, what did I do wrong? Was, did I initiate this? Was I starting to... And they, they second-guess themselves and just give up. And, and, of course, they're oftentimes very embarrassed in a lot of other things. Uh, sometimes they uh, felt that, well, they were tricked into this. They were groomed into this. Uh, these are the kind of things that have gone on. And they just don't know how they can ever recover uh, their, themselves from that. And, you know, some of, the, some of the priests who committed suicide just couldn't deal with, you know, the public shame. They, you know, which is understandable. Uh, sometimes they uh, can't deal with the fear of, you know, criminal uh, condemnation, you know, uh, you know, criminal procedures, and being punished by the state. And it all, you know, it's, it's rough time for them in, in prison. Um, oftentimes the prison inmates are more harsh on child sex abusers and other child physical abusers because they them, the majority of them had been abused when they were children. And, that's, and so there's a fear of the inmates and going to prison. And some guys just, again, commit suicide as an act of despair. And, you know, it's, it's somewhat, it's of course shocking because these are also priests who had heard confessions. And I would hope that they had been merciful to their penitents in confession, but may not have been able to see that they might ever find mercy. It's hard to say. But this is something where all of us, whenever we are dealing with sin, especially when sin becomes very public, um, this happens a lot these days, by the way. You know, there's um, a, a lot of people you know, all over our society who shame other people for their sins. Um, they, they use their bad behavior against them. We see this in our politics all the time. You know, it, uh, and it, it's oftentimes used by political enemies to undercut their political stances and things like that. And people in the media you have to be very, very cautious about spreading even true statements you know, about other people, um, because the, the goal isn't, I gotcha, and I can therefore control you. That's oftentimes what goes on. But it's rather that how do we help people find reconciliation? How do they find forgiveness? How do they find hope? for restoring their loves. In fact, when uh, I was at that women's prison in, you know, outside of Austin, Texas, uh, for Christmas, you know, they, they have a ministry of restorative justice in that diocese of Austin, Texas. Because the goal is not to force former offenders or ex-offenders to wallow in their sin, but rather how do they come to Jesus Christ and find reconciliation and healing? And this is a very important element for all of us. We won't find that with our own personal resources. It really takes the grace of God. And this is where we in the church need to be those folks who are willing to be ministers of that grace of God. How, how well aware am I of the ways that God has forgiven me? How aware am I of the reconciliation?